Hi everyone, my name is Nazmele Kamganamayaba and welcome to my YouTube channel. Um, once again, thank you so much for all the likes, the subscriptions, the comments. Um, some of you have reached out to me directly. I just want to let you know that I appreciate each and every one of you. Um, you've truly meant a lot to me and you've made this whole process so much easier. So today, I'm going to talk about something that you've been asking me, um, you know, for quite some time in terms of how did I go about disclosing my status to my family? How did I go about disclosing my status, particularly to my husband? Um, so yeah, that's what I wanted to share in terms of my own story. And if you're someone that is going um, um, through that journey or through that process, I really hope that this will help you. So the very first thing that I wanted to say is, I wanted to disclose this quite early, is that I never planned to, you know, disclose my status to my mom. Um, because as I shared, uh, my mom worked at a, at a hospital for 29 years. She was a cleaner. Um, it was a TB hospital, and by virtue of being a TB hospital, she worked a lot with HIV um, positive patients. And some of them actually died in her arms. Some of them she saw vanishing right before their eyes, uh, her eyes. Um, and some of them she actually, you know, had to, um, um, you know, take care of and, and nurse um, up until a point where they were okay. So she saw all of it. And for that reason, all of that became, you know, a topic of conversation all the time in our household. Um, that's all she she could talk about, you know, um, the fact that, you know, the decisions that we make should never lead us to such a situation. Um, we should keep ourselves, you know, pure until marriage. Um, that's why I didn't date um, growing up um, because her fear was that I'll be in that situation where I'll find myself HIV positive. Um, and for that reason, for me years later to go back to her and tell her that I had been I had been infected with HIV, I, don't, I didn't think that it was something that she could she could deal with. Um, I'll often say to my friends, you know, I didn't want to be responsible for killing my mom. Um, so that's why I decided, I didn't even think about it, um, you know, for, for a long time. I decided that this was not something that I was going to do and that was it. Um, but I will tell you what had led to changing my mind. So the first people that I actually disclosed to were my friends. Um, and that's the, first, that's the first thing that I wanted to discuss. Um, if you're going through something similar or you find yourself have, having to, um, you know, share difficult um, news, um, before you actually, you know, deal with family members or a partner or so that, please find someone that you are comfortable in, um, um, in talking to. The reason for that is, um, I, when I look back, I really thank God that I didn't, the first, pe the per first person that I spoke to, um, what I was in my mom, because I can't imagine being in such a vulnerable situation, um, or being in such a vulnerable place, seeking comfort and it, to a person that was not also not ready to give comfort, um, and reassurance and love. What I mean about that. If, if, if I had disclosed to my mom, like immediately after I had been infected, I, I was hysterical, I was suicidal, I wasn't thinking straight. And disclosing to my mom, who was also getting around the idea, who would have gotten around the idea of me being HIV positive, thinking I was dying, we would not have been a good match for each other. In actual fact, I think we would have hurt each other more than helping each other. Um, and I don't even know what you know um, would have led me to do um, in such a situation. I would have actually even gone and committed suicide because I wouldn't have been able to handle how my mom was, um, you know, reacting to the whole situation. So the very first people that I spoke to were my friends, and not even once did I find, you know, that um, there was judgment. They were treating me differently. In natural fact, they gave more love and support than I could have ever imagined. Um, I called these people at 1 a.m. at 2 a.m. in the morning, cry, uh, a.m. in the morning, crying my lungs out, and they would listen. Um, and they they just offered so much support. So to someone that doesn't necessarily have you know friends, um, um, you know that could offer the same support, I would advise that you get yourself a social worker or a psychologist 
therapist um, that you can talk to, you know, just share your feelings up until a point where you are strong. By that, I mean up until a point where you can handle any type of rejection, any type of humiliation that will not set you back um, in terms of your healing. Um, so that's the very first thing I, I would like to tell you. Um, just find someone that you can speak to. In my case, it was friends and they made it so easier. And for many years, for about, I'll say three, four years, up until a point I met my husband, and then I, I obviously dis, um, disclosed to him, they were the people that, was, that were, were responsible truly for my healing. The second person that I disclosed to was uh, my husband. So I met Ku, um, uh, f uh, February, no, actually April, he's going to kill me for this. April of 2016, I shared the story um, on social media. Um, I was on my way to a conference and you know i was in work mode you know i i was traveling from pe to johannesburg and i i didn't notice anyone truly and when i landed in johannesburg i had my earphones on um i didn't have any music actually but i just wanted i didn't want anyone to disturb me because i was practicing my speech and I, I, I felt someone tapping my shoulder and just trying to get my attention. And at first, um, I purposely ignored them, but they kept on persisting. And I was like, okay. And I turned back and there's this gentleman who was trying to get my attention. And you can see that I still have my earphones on, but he keeps on talking regardless. So eventually I take my earphones off. Um, and I start talking to him and he wanted to know my name and what I do for a living. And we eventually went to collect our luggage and we we're busy talking, you know, and eventually I was like, oh, can I have your number? Because I'm interested, you know, in the type of work that you do. I like to visit. I work for an NGO. I like to visit, um, you know, and see the work firsthand. And I was like, I don't give any numbers to anyone. And he said, oh, okay, no, that, that, that's not a problem. I'll give you my number. So he gave me his number. And I purposely lost his number on my way to collect my rental car. And that I thought that was it. But a week later, I got a call from work saying, you know, there's a Craig on the line that wants to speak to me. Um, the only Craig that I knew was our HR manager and he was in the next room that um, he was in the next room. So I was confused in terms of, I don't know any other Craig, but the reception was, was quite, you know, persistent that no, this person needs to speak to you. But to cut the long story short, it was cool. <laughs> and um, he came to visit um, uh, me at work. And, you know, um, our relationship was, you know, um, first, uh, let me not say relationship, it was a friendship. Um, and, you know, we started chatting, um, you know, on email and all those things because I didn't, I still refused to give him my phone number. So we chatted on my Gmail account. Um, and eventually, um, as things developed, like about a month later, we were talking continuously. I felt comfortable with him. I don't know, there was something about him that just made me comfortable. And, um, you know, he, he asked if we could meet um, a month later um, because we had only been talking on email. So I met up with him and from the word go, my intentions were, I'm going to tell this guy that I'm HIV positive and whether he stays or not, mm, I don't care. Um, so that's what I, I, I'm trying to get to in terms of when I had met or had made the decision to disclose to school, um, I was already emotionally strong and ready for anything um, that it, it, where whatever he had said, it wouldn't have set me back. So I remember um, we had met up for lunch and I already told him that there's something that I need to speak to him about. And, you know, I, I started talking, you know, about the fact that how I grew up and I met this person. And um, unfortunately, because I was so naive, um, I made the wrong decision. Um, and for that reason, I, I got infected with HIV. And I remember he was sitting across me. Um, I had made an intention before we go to lunch, if we could meet up at his place um, so that we can have a private conversation um, before we go to lunch. And because I didn't want him to, <laughs> I didn't want him to leave me at the table after I told him, you know, when we're having lunch. Um, so I'm joking. So um, I told him the whole time I was speaking to him, he was just listening. There was not even one single change of emotion or anything. 
he was he was literally it makes me emotional just even thinking about it the whole time he was listening to me um you know um he didn't ask any questions and after i had i had finished and he said and he asked are you finished and i said yes and he said um how are you feeling and i said i'm actually fine um i'm glad that i had spoken to you and i'm glad that i had um talked to you and he said to me i'm glad that um you had um the courage to um to tell me and um to be comfortable in telling me i appreciate that about you and that will be it honestly that will be it um i don't remember any other conversation that you know that we had in terms of oh okay um you know um do you feel like you could have done you know something differently or any other conversation that you know that would have been negative towards that um that will be it um the only conversation that we ever had was in terms of how do we better protect ourselves you know i was starting my treatment what what does he have to take um the fact that we had to we have to practice uh, practice safe sex using condoms all the time so that that was basically disclosing to school um and and that will be it the, the third person that i needed to disclose to um was my mom and I want to be honest um, that I didn't disclose to my mom until recently. And what made me disclose to her was because I already uh, made the decision that I was coming out with my story. And obviously, um, I didn't want, I knew the story would probably, you know, get the attention of many people. And I didn't want her um, to get um, the story from someone else. She needed to um, get the story from me. Um, so obviously being in Johannesburg, um, you know, when I had this conversation all the time in terms of it would be better to travel to PE and, you know, and tell her in person. But um, because of our travels and because, you know, um, of our work, it became difficult. And um, so I remember, I, you know, I was I was sitting, um, you know, um, in my uh, here at, at home and I met the call and my mom only knows that I had been through a difficult breakup. Um, that's the only thing she knows. She doesn't, she didn't know anything else. So when I called her, I remember telling her, um, there's something that I want to tell you. And she said, okay, what is it? And I said to her, before I tell you, you need to promise me, um, that, you know, you, you're going to be okay. And obviously that, you know, she panicked more. It's like, just tell me what it is. And I said to her, I just want to let you know um, that as I'm about to tell you, continuously remember that I am okay. I'm really, really okay. And um, she's like, what is it? Just tell me. Just tell me what happened. And I don't know. I, I, could, not, I could not get the words out of my mouth. I tried so bad, but I could not. I could simply not tell her that the words could not come out. And um, so I dropped the call and um, what I forgot to tell you is that I had also prior to telling my mom, I had told my brother. Um, so I forgot to actually tell, you know, call my brother and tell him that I was in the process of telling Ma. So I continued with whatever, with, with, with whatever that I was doing. Um, an hour later, my brother texts me and says, oh, by the way, thanks for warning me. And I thought he was referring to something else. It didn't click what he was referring to. So I laughed it off and I was like, yeah, no, dude, I'm serious. Um, so that's when it got to me. I was like, oh my gosh, um, I think, I, like, I don't think he's, please Lord, let him not, you know, refer to what I'm, I think he's referring to. Um, I called him and he said, um, your mom just called and um, she was persistent that I should tell her um, what she wanted to tell her. Um, he tried to divert the conversation, but mom was adamant that he, he needs to tell her and mom kept on saying, you know, you two are close. So I know whatever she wants to tell me, you probably know. So just tell me. So, um, my brother told my mom, um, um, yeah, that's how my mom found out. And I waited for about half an hour, um, before I called her and, um, when I was getting ready to call her, I chickened out, I chickened out again. 
um, about two hours later um, she calls me and I can hear she's crying over the phone but she she starts talking about you know uh, about what something that she had asked my brother to do but my brother did not and she she didn't you know I, I can't believe um, I can't believe um, you know Malatis doesn't um, 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 care for me and all of those things but I knew um, she was reacting um, to the situation and um, she just also could not um, I guess she didn't know what to do and the net that like the the only thing I remember is her crying over the phone and I, the only thing I could do is just listen um, and eventually as she was crying and um, sorry as she was crying um, the only thing I could do is saying to her is mama I'm fine I'm really fine um, mama I'm fine like that's the only thing I, I remember like just telling her and um so we dropped the call and um you know uh, being me the control freak i probably um thought about a million times in just getting a flight and a flight and going back home um but because of my brother and my husband they told me you know i should just wait a bit um until you know she she's able to um come back to herself and I must be honest that I'm really blessed and um, and lucky that I found um, such a support system because the next conversation that I will have with her is a conversation of um, is there anything I can do for you um, do you want me to come to Johannesburg um, like what can I do for you that will be the next conversation um, so Sorry guys. That's how um, the process of coming out um, to to my family was, and um, yeah.